Over 150 years ago, a community of faith was born under the guidance of the prophet Baha'u'llah, a title that means the glory of God, and under the banner that the mightiest instrument for the healing of all the peoples of the world is the union in one universal cause, one common faith. Today we examine the question, who are the Baha'is, on this edition of Light of Unity. Welcome to Light of Unity. I'm in Wandi Lawson. To answer the question, who are the Baha'is, I'm joined today by three members of the Metro Atlanta Baha'i community. We have with us today Mr. Harold Edwards. He is a training consultant. Polly Boyd, she is a clinical psychologist. And we also have educator Greg Kagira Watson in studio with us today. So welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us here. And we really just want to help friends who want to learn a little bit more about the Baha'i faith to understand exactly what is this Baha'i faith and who are these Baha'is. So I thought we might start by just talking a little bit about the three, what we call the three unities in the Baha'i faith, and those are the unity of God and religion and humanity. I'm wondering, Harold, I see, I see you nodding your head there yeah, a little bit. Right. When you hear about this, this as a concept, the, these unities, how can you help people to kind of understand what that means to the Baha'is? Well, it's always good to know that unity always was one. It's just that the people, because of where they were thousands of years ago, they didn't understand the unity of oneness concept because they were so diverse and they were taught to be so diverse. Mm -hmm. So to look at the oneness of unity, whether it was oneness of God, oneness of religion, oneness of humankind, that was just something that was very foreign to us. Mm -hmm. Now you jump from there to where we are now to the 21st century, even from there to where Muhammad came in, mm -hmm. and Muhammad really introduced the concept of oneness of humankind, oneness of religions, and then it just stopped there. The people didn't know where to go with that. Mm -hmm. So where at the time we're living in now, people, because of television, satellites, everything, people see the oneness of everything <coughs> there. They, they learned in school about the oneness of religion, and, and so they're wondering, how can you make this a reality? where Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, has come in and said to us as Baha'is, this is the time for us to actually manifest and live this oneness. Mm -hmm. Oneness always was. God is one. Religion always was one. Humankind always was one. Now we're at a level and a time where we can actually apply those kind of principles and live because this world is a very small planet now, mm -hmm. and we cannot live together if we stay so divided and not accept those principles as oneness. One God, one religion, one humankind. Sometimes people think that oneness is sameness, and the Baha'i concept of oneness, there is unity and diversity. <coughs> and so, Polly, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that as a concept. Absolutely. Um, every culture, every faith, um, every community has its own uh, values, its own ways of worshiping, its own history, music, and all of them are wonderful. We certainly wouldn't want all the world to look the same or all of the um, food to be the same when we travel. <laughs> That's, I mean, you know, when we go anywhere in the world, we love to discover and learn about the music, the d traditions, the uh, dances, the food, the culture and the religion, and all of them are valid and wonderful, and there's no competition between them. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, we honor and respect all of the cultures, all of the religions, and for, for instance, we, uh, one of the laws is a universal language, mm -hmm. and yet that would be to learn in addition to our mother tongue. They, uh, we're not supposed to lose our mother tongue or our own culture. So you're saying Baha'is right. are working toward the time that there would be one universal language in Absolutely. addition to the multitude of languages that right. we speak today. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. What about this concept for you, Greg, as far as the, the unity, these three unities that we speak about, God, humanity, as well as man, as well as all of the religions? Well, the, the laws of science have already proved the oneness of humanity. And because we have not only science, but 
we've been pressured or pushed together as a neighborhood. The entire world collapsed into a, a neighborhood now. We have to deal with each other. All the peoples whose um, various and colorful cultures and backgrounds are so wonderful uh, are learning to appreciate each other. And yet this us and them mentality has been the cause of wars and genocide and all sorts of problems, even in the name of religion. So I think that's our challenge in this time. The gift of God in this day, uh, in this enlightened, enlightened age, is the oneness of humanity and the oneness of religion in the sense that we can all see we have come from one source and we are the children of one God and that these differences should not be enough difference to make a difference. Mm. We've, we've got artificial differences that we're inventing and, and creating to divide us while if we live that way and continue to live that way, life is not sustainable on the planet. So actually the title of this program, Light of Unity, comes from a quote from Baha'u'llah that says that so powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. And as we're looking at uh, kind of the teachings of the Baha'i faith and how that lives uh, in, in today's world and how we're, how we're taught to, to go out and, and, and show that, Harold made reference to Muhammad. We also know that, of course, Baha'is come from Christian traditions, some come from Islamic traditions, some come from, you know, all the various faith traditions mm -hmm. of the world. How does that kind of live itself out in the Baha'i community? Anyone of you want to take that? Well, uh, uh, we're living in a time now, the kids are learning so much from elementary school right on up. If kids understood that all these teachers are the same teachers, and the teachers that teach us give it different information based on where we are in our lives. And if we ever still understood those principles, why are there so many prophets? Why are there the Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad? Uh, why, why are there Baha'u'llah and the Bob? They're there because, number one, they came at a particular time in history to give us basic fundamentals that we needed thousands of years ago. And as humankind progressed, another teacher would come and build on those basic fundamentals in the past and continue to grow. We can accept that different teachers concept in school, but when it comes to religion, we don't accept it. We think that one is right, one is wrong, one is better, and one is less than. So if people understand that the virtue of religion is not about there's conflict in religion, the conflict came from humankind not accepting the next messenger that came to build on that foundation of the other messenger before built on. Mm -hmm. For example, Jesus built on the foundation of Moses. And for those who are still looking for the Messiah, those who are Christians say, okay, the Messiah is coming gone, you crucified him. Mm -hmm. But for those who didn't accept the Messiah, they're still there waiting for the Messiah to come, <coughs> based upon their understanding. Mm -hmm. So that creates a conflict. But Jesus was who he was. He said, if you would have known Moses, you'd known me because Moses told you about me to come. So the people, the messengers always tell the truth, but the people get sidetracked in what they want to believe is the truth or not. Hmm. So what does that look like then in, in the real world? People will say, okay, sure, you have this idea that you can bring together all of these religions, mm -hmm. but we see in the world that there's a lot of conflict around this. So in your experience, Polly, what does it look like in the Baha'i community? Well, in the Baha'i community, we collaborate with our friends of faith, of all faiths. And for instance, just this last Sunday, we had an, an interfaith unity gospel concert. It was, mm. it was wonderful. So, you know, we had choirs from churches and from the Baha'i community and from the Muslim community. And a friend of mine reminded me we need to invite the Buddhist choir. So, um, you know, it's a matter of us all working together, not just to praise the Lord, but also to work together and collaborate in terms of developing our communities, working together to, to serve the homeless, to, to develop children's programs, to um, in whatever ways that we can strengthen our communities with an understanding of collaboration instead of competition. And we as Baha'i uh, communities educate our children about all of the religions so that our children know to, to honor and um, respect the teachings of all the prophets. So we don't only um, study the writings of Baha'u'llah, we study the writings of all the holy books. The teacher for this day, as the Baha'is believe, is Baha'u'llah. 
Tell us more about that, Greg, because so for so many people, that the name Baha'u'llah is completely new. Who, who is Baha'u'llah, and, and why is he the voice of God for this day? Well, in, in every age, the needs of people are different. And about 150 years ago, uh, almost anyone with any kind of perception looking at the progress of civilization, history, uh, social change, will recognize we entered a new cycle of human power. We entered a new era by whatever name you wish to call it. Some people refer to it as the Age of Enlightenment, the Age of Aquarius, the Atomic Age, uh, beyond the Industrial Revolution, um, certainly the 20th century. And the Age of Science uh, is a release of new knowledge. And Baha'is see that this transformation of the planet and, and not just society, but the entire civilization, the world, was the result of a release of a new spirit, the Holy Spirit infused a new consciousness into the minds and hearts of men. New social reforms, new scientific inventions were inspired into these minds. And oddly enough, at the same time, a man appears and articulates this word of God and speaks that this era is about to be born. He speaks of a worldwide regeneration. He speaks of the fulfillment of 6,000 years of prophecy in what we refer to as the Adamic cycle. Uh, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, which many of us come from, uh, I was a youth minister in a church at the time I became a Baha'i, uh, understood that the succession of these prophets was to educate humanity, and we we're always supposed to be looking for another, but it seems like every time he appears, he's persecuted, he's killed, he's crucified. That was Stephen's testimony at the time he was uh, killed, that always people resist this Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is released in two ways. One, through God's mouthpiece for that time in history. Jesus spoke the word of God. The word of God has existed since before the foundation of the world. Before the body of Jesus was born of Mary, the word existed pre-existent with the Father. In the beginning. And that word has returned and is spoken again and is spoken anew through this messenger, which we refer to as the manifestation of God. And his name is Baha'u'llah. It's a new name, it's a strange name, but the Bible even prophesies the coming of a new name which no one would know except those who receive it. Mm. And a title that means the glory of God. Yeah. Yes, like Christ is a title, meaning the anointed one, mm -hmm. Christos from the Greek. Very interesting. So the life of Baha'u'llah, though, is very important, obviously, to Baha'is as well in not only realizing his, uh, him as the manifestation of God, but also in the work that is done in the community as well. So, Harold, can you tell us just a little bit about kind of the, the, the life of Baha'u'llah and, and how the Baha'i faith was born? Baha'u'llah was born in 1817. And prior to Baha'u'llah becoming who he was, similar to the time of Christianity. John the Baptist was going through the wilderness, prophesying and talking about the Messiah to come. In the Baha'i faith, before Baha'u'llah announced who he was, there was a prophet called the Bab, and his job was to lay the foundation for Baha'u'llah, like John the Baptist laid the foundation for, for Jesus. And then the Bab, of course, is a title as well, right? Meaning right. the gate. It means the gate, exactly. So Baha'u'llah, the Bab was doing this for nine years. He talked about the coming of Baha'u'llah, as well as being a messenger from God, a manifestation, he had his own holy book, had his own teachings, and he taught the, ba the ba they were called Bobbies at that time. And he taught them the things they should do to share this message, at the same time be prepared for the one to come after him, which is Baha'u'llah, who's going to bring some new teachings for those, unite the whole world to one planet, one people, please. So Baha'u'llah, when he accepted his claim and time to prophesy, then he implemented all these these new principles, oneness of God, oneness of religion, equality of men and women, mm. you know, a, uh, equal opportunity for education for all of God's children, you know, uh, spiritual solution to the economic problems of the world, yeah. you know. These kind of things were something that weren't talked about. Mankind and women, women and men were not equal at that time. Mm -hmm. And at that time he announced that in the East that was something the men had a hard time, especially the Muslims, they had a hard time accepting that. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of Bobbies and Baha'is that were killed as a result of announcing that it was time that for equality of human, women and women, emancipation of slavery, all those kind of things in the early 1800s he talked about. Those were the foundations that were laid then. Over 20,000 followers of Baha'u'llah were martyred for this faith. 
So now we're in the 21st century where these things, principles, just basic, generic to all of humankind. But in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, they were not mm -hmm. the norm for all of humankind. So that's what the whole idea in the early 1800s, to lay those kind of foundations with principles that made it possible for us to say, yeah, these are it's a simple stuff now. Absolutely. But it wasn't simple in the time when Baha'u'llah laid that claim and 20,000 of his followers were martyred mm -hmm. and killed for their faith. And this resistance uh, re resulted in tremendous persecution of the Baha'i community on the part of the clergy and, and the uh, government of Persia, where the faith was born, the modern-day country of Iran. And as Harold said, uh, they tried to wipe it out and 20,000 of the early believers were killed. And for this, also, Baha'u'llah was thrown into prison because he was identified with that earlier movement, the forerunner, uh, the Bob, who was like John the Baptist, preparing the way. And he was thrown into a prison that was so vile and awful that uh, it's amazing he could have survived. He was in chains, and uh, these chains were so famous they had their own name, uh, weighed over 100 pounds uh, around his neck, this collar that was around his neck actually cut through the bones and he bore those scars all his life. He was in that dungeon for uh, two and a half months with uh, you know, human excrement on the floor up over their wrists and uh, it was complete darkness, three stories underground, no light to get in. They nearly starved him to death. He went in there <laughs> looking younger. He came out and his hair was solid white. In two and a half months it turned his hair white. He was poisoned three times. He was banished from Iran to, to Baghdad, to Adrianople, Constantinople, and finally to Akka, the prison city across the bay from Haifa, Israel. Today is uh, Israel's most famous seaport, and that's where the world center of the Baha'i faith is as a result of Baha'u'llah being taken there in chains. And it seems this is God's method from all eternity to all eternity. All his prophets and messengers have been persecuted, and I suppose it's part of their credibility that they're willing to undergo this to declare, and, and it's a testimony to their sincerity and the reality of their mission. We only have a few minutes left to talk together, but I wanted to turn to you, Polly, for a moment, because I know each of you have some very personal spiritual journeys that have kind of brought you to the Baha'i faith, and I'm wondering, in, in your case, how did you discover the faith and what, what drew you to it? Well, I was actually in college, and I had been, uh, I was raised in the church. My father's an Episcopal priest, and um, my parents taught us the oneness of humanity and basically the oneness of religion and I just kept thinking it must be time for Christ to come again hmm. and um, when I finally ran into the some of the Baha'is and the first thing they told me that the Baha'i faith was about was the oneness of humanity and I said well yeah that's clear <laughs> <laughs> and then they told me about progressive revelation and explain what that is? Progressive revelation is the idea that uh, Harold was talking to earlier, that every prophet or manifestation has come progressively through the evolution of humanity's maturation to bring us what we were ready for. They never said, forget what the prophet before me said. They built on it, just like when we go through school. We learn progressively. Mm -hmm. We learn something in third grade that builds on what we learned in first and second grade. So when, it, when I suddenly realized that it wasn't just that there was no competition between the religions, but that there was actually a design where each prophet came to build on what the prophet before had talked about. Mm -hmm. And Baha'u'llah is here to bring the oneness of the world. Mm -hmm. So. That was very that was exciting to me, embrace. yes. Well, Harold and, and Polly and Greg, it's been a pleasure getting a chance to talk to you and to find out a little bit more about who the Baha'is are. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue with Light of Unity with a segment dealing a little bit more about what Baha'i youth are getting into. And i got to tell you, it's all around the world. You want to stay tuned. Light of Unity continues right after this.